Welcome to Church of the Harvest this morning. Welcome to your house as we're coming into your homes like we've been doing for the last uh, uh, two months. It feels like two years, but it's the last two months we've been coming into your homes week after week. Uh, so I hope you have a coffee in your hand or whatever, a bowl of cereal, whatever you're eating, breakfast maybe, I don't know. Uh, but hopefully uh, today's service will be a blessing to you. Uh, I have a, some some announcements we're going to get to in just a moment. We're going to have a time of worship. I'm going to be uh, bringing the last uh, part of a series entitled The Second Coming uh, of Jesus. And so uh, hopefully you'll be blessed by it. But before we get into all of that, let's just take a moment and just join me as we begin to pray. Heavenly Father, we honor you today. We magnify your name. Father, we thank you because you are able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. Father, I ask that you would move in the hearts and in the lives of your people today. Father, wherever they are watching from, whatever uh, means that they're using to watch me, whether on a phone, on an iPad, on a computer, on their TV screen, Father, however it's getting into their home, Father, I pray that you would be able to move in a supernatural and a mighty way in their hearts and in their lives. Father, we give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. Father, I pray that if there's somebody struggling in their life, at the, whatever situation they might be struggling with, Father, your word says that you're able to deliver, to heal, to set free, to redeem. And so, Father, I ask that you would do it right now in their homes, wherever they are. In Jesus' mighty, wonderful name we pray. Amen. So join us as we go into a time of worship. Uh, We uh, begun recording the worship again here at church, uh, all still in obedience to the guidelines that the government has uh, uh, prescribed. Uh, But we believe that we're going to be opening up uh, uh, surely, slowly but surely. And so we're uh, in the process of getting things in place. So um, our worship was uh, recorded here, and so we'll be able to uh, worship together, and hopefully very soon you'll be able to come and, and we'll be able to uh, fill this church building uh, again and worship together. In the meantime, we're coming into your home. I love you. God bless you. I'll see you soon as we get into the Word of God. This is amazing place. 
This is a failing cup That you will take my place That you will bear my cross You lay down your life That I will be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Savior, 
Savior, He can 
Well, welcome back. I hope and I pray that that was a, a moment where you were blessed and were able to uh, just get into the presence of the Lord. Just a few quick announcements before we get into the Word of God. Uh, first and foremost, uh, welcome to church. Uh, if you're new with us, if you're watching for for the first time, let us know. Write to us. Either via, you could use our uh, website. You could go on there. There's an area where you could contact us uh, and just send us an email. You could uh, send it to info at churchoftheharvest.ca. And so we appreciate it. We'd love to know who you are, uh, where you're watching from, uh, how you heard of us. And if you're watching online, you're watching either on Facebook, you're watching on YouTube, or you're watching directly on our website. If you're on one of the social media platforms, uh, put, a, put a comment there. Let us know uh, that you're watching. If ever uh, I say something that uh, touches your heart or you believe in, uh, just say amen. You know, that's the way you can't be here physically to say amen, but you could do so virtually uh, on uh, on social media. Uh, quick few announcements. This coming Wednesday night, we are uh, having our second uh, church Zoom meeting. So if you're part of our church, this is your home church. Uh, you could connect to us via, and it, we say Zoom, but it's like Zoom. It's called GoToMeeting, uh, and you've received already a link for that, um, that service, which is this coming Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, one hour only. So from 7 to 8 o'clock, and then at 8.15 to 9.15, one hour as well. We have a French one. Uh, so I'll be there. Uh, some of our leaders will be on as well. And all of you that are part of our church are, are able to, um, to attend. Uh, either one, whichever you prefer, the English or the French. English will be at 7 o'clock. French will be at uh, 8.15. So log on to that. Also, we have a uh, uh, closed group Facebook page for all of the members of our church to be able to share and communicate with you. Uh, if you've not received an invitation for that, or if you'd like to be a part of that private page, uh, you could send us an email at info at churchoftheharvest.ca. However, you should have received uh, that in the same email as the go to meetings. With that being said, I want to read a verse of scripture. Uh, for your giving, we're, we're, we're still tithing, we're still giving, we're still the church. You know, just because we're, uh, we're going through a pandemic and just because we're, uh, we're isolated in, in our different homes doesn't mean we stop believing in God, doesn't mean we stop praying, doesn't mean we stop going to church like you are uh, this morning via, uh, uh, via live uh, service, but that means we also continue to give. And there's a, a verse of scripture, which I, you know, if you've grown up in church, you've probably heard it often when we talk about giving and tithing, uh, but one of our uh, a man, young man that attends our church who uh, has a young family, uh, and he had never heard this verse of Scripture. It, it, he, he didn't know that God promised this uh, in His Word, uh, and so uh, he came by and see me uh, this week at church, and I was sharing uh, this with him, and I want to read it to you. It's in Malachi chapter number 3, verse 10. The Bible says this, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there might be food in my house, and try me now in this, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Verse 11, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fall bare. Uh, fruit for you in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. So God gives this promise as, you, as you're a tither. Tither means uh, you sow 10% of everything that God uh, blesses you with into 
for the advancement of the kingdom of God. So if this is your home church, that's where you sow. If you go to another church somewhere else, that's where you sow uh, your tithe and, and your offering. And so we believe, and, and I believe the word of God is true. I believe God is alive. I believe he's living. I believe Jesus is raised from the dead. I believe that this word is inspired by God. And so if God makes a promise in his word and says, if you'll do this, I'll do that, then I believe it. And so I want to encourage you to be a tither, be a giver. And I know many of you are, uh, and our church is blessed. We're, we're abundantly blessed as a church, but I just wanted to encourage you that God's word is not just so that the, the church as a whole or the organization could be blessed, but you're his church, you're his son, you're his daughter, and God wants you to walk in the fullness of the provision of God for your life. And one of the ways to access the fullness of God's provision is to obey his word in, in regards to tithing, in regards to offering, in regards to giving. And as you put God's word in practice in your life, in any area of your life, you'll see God move supernaturally day after day week after week year after year where you turn around one day and says wow look where I started from look where God brought me to and God will do the same he did that for me he did that for thousands of people that I know of he did that for all of his children throughout the uh, the course of history and he'll do it for you in your life amen so with that being said uh, we're going to get right into the message of today. I believe that's it for the announcements oh one more announcement if you want to become a member of our church we do have a uh, uh, we have um, an app. It's called the Church App. You could download it. Uh, through that app, you could log in, put all of your information in there. That'll be You'll be part of our database. And if you would like to become a member of our church, you could apply uh, to become a member, fill out the membership form, all right there throughout the app. There's a PDF form uh, that you could send to us. And if you're giving, you could give. There's two primary ways to do it. You could either go online at our website, www.churchoftheharvest.ca you could give through Canada Helps uh, and also or you could simply uh, mail your gifts into the church here and uh, we'll receive those and those will be deposited once at the end of the month uh, because of all of our all of the COVID situation uh, our accounting team that does those deposits will just be in one time at the end of the month amen so let's get right into the word of God if you have a Bible get it out go with me to Genesis Genesis chapter number 37. We're going to look at the life of Joseph today. Uh, and we're going to look at it from two different angles. And, and I'm, I'm concluding the message on the, on the return of the Lord um, this week. And, and we're going to go into something else for, for next week moving forward. Uh, but I wanted to end on, um, this is going to be a partially uh, encouraging message on, on a practical application of the life of Joseph. And then the last part of this message this morning uh, will deal with the prophetic application of the life of Joseph and how that, uh, in, in the story of Joseph, and we're going to, uh, for those of you that have no idea who Joseph is, if maybe you're new to church, you're new to Christianity, well, you're going to get a history lesson. You're going to get a lesson on the life of Joseph today. Uh, hopefully, you'll be able to apply it in your life, and it'll prosper you, and it'll bless you. Uh, but then there's also, hidden within the, the life of Joseph, is the story of Jesus, the, the prophetically what Jesus would come to do. And also, within the story of Jesus, is a, is a beautiful prophetic gem of how and when Jesus will be coming back the second time. And so I pray that you're going to be blessed by that. But before we get in, uh, let's just give you a little bit of a, 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 a history lesson about the life of Joseph. Uh, we read his life. For those of you that don't know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Abraham was a man that God called and set apart. And he uh, began to leave his family, leave his home, journeyed uh, into a new, a new land, new country. Uh, God made a covenant with Abraham. He said, I'll bless your descendants will be blessed. Your children will be blessed. And then uh, his son, Isaac, and then Isaac had Jacob. Jacob was a, a trickster, was a manipulator, was a liar, uh, but he wrestled with God. God, uh, uh, God won, but he tried. God changed his name to Israel. And then Jacob, who, whose name was changed to Israel, gave birth to 13 boys. Uh, 12 of the 13, so with the exception of Joseph, Joseph was one of, the thir uh, of his children, 12 of them uh, the names of the 12 tribes of Israel were, were born through uh, the children of Jacob. So Jacob's sons, each one of them, uh, became the head of one of the 12 nations of Israel, with the exception of Joseph. And Joseph's life was different than the other brothers, and we're going to see that in just a minute. Uh, but in Genesis chapter 37, we read the story 
of the of the beginning of Joseph's life, and Joseph is growing up in a uh, in a family where he is the at the time he is the second to youngest child. So he has eleven older brothers. There's him, and then there's his younger brother uh, Benjamin. And so Jake, uh, Joseph is favored by his father Jacob. The Bible says that um, his father gives him a coat of many colors. That that's a a, a representation that um, his father Jacob had had a, a a little bit of a favoritism for him versus the other boys. Doesn't mean that he didn't love his other sons, but he favored uh, Jacob. He favored Joseph over the over the other sons, and so God is uh, is elevating Joseph. Even that Joseph would get a dream, and in his dream uh, he had two different dreams, but in both the dreams they meant the same thing, where all of his family would be bowing down and worshiping him. So when we look at the early years of the life of Joseph, what we see is we see a young man uh, that is serving God, that's living for God, that loves the Lord, that gets a dream from God, that God would put him into a, p- a position of authority, of power, where, where his family would come and, and bow down and worship him. So his dream kind of gets Joseph in a little bit of trouble uh, when, he, when he begins to share that dream with his brothers. In Genesis chapter uh, 37, we're going to pick it up at verse 18. The Bible says this, So when his brothers saw him afar off, even before he came near them, they conspired against him to kill him. Then they said to one another, look at this dreamer is coming. Come therefore, let us, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit. And, and we will say that some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams. Then Reuben heard it and delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, shed not, shed not his blood, but cast him into the pit, uh, which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him, that he might uh, deliver him out of, the, out of their hands and bring him back to their father. Then go, ba- go down to verse 26. The Bible says, so Judah said to the other brothers, what profit is there if we kill him or if our brother Uh, or if we conceal his blood, verse 27, come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him. For, his, for he is our brother and our flesh and his, uh, and his brothers listen. Then the Midianite traders passed by. So the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they took, uh, and they took Joseph to Egypt. So here we have the, the beginning of the life of Joseph. Joseph, his life starts out really good. He's born in a wealthy home. Uh, his, his father Jacob is, is a wealthy man inheriting from his father Abraham to his, uh, his grandfather Abraham to his father Isaac to him, Jacob. Uh, he's got a, a bunch of boys at home which, which uh, added to the prosperity of their home. Uh, he, was, uh, he was in the lineage. You know, uh, the Israelites later on would say, we believe in the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob. So that lineage of faith was there. And, and Joseph was favored not only by his, his earthly father, Jacob, but he was favored by God. God had a plan and a call and a purpose on his life, which he revealed to him in dreams. But then when he shares the dreams with his brothers, you know, not everybody will love the, uh, will be happy for you. Not everybody will love the fact that God wants to use you, especially sometimes people that are in your own family, people that are closest to you. Sometimes they could be on one hand, they love you. On one hand, they want, you know, they want you to be okay. They don't want you, you know, the family is often a great blessing. But then sometimes they don't really want you to do too good because there's, there's jealousy that could set in and there's, there's issues that could, uh, that, could, uh, that could come up. Oftentimes when somebody passes away, some of the biggest fights in families are about inheritance and who gets what and who is more. And so all of these things happen. And so you see that even in the, the life of Joseph, as God gives him this dream, His brothers, uh, they hate him for it. They want to kill him. So then a few of them, Reuben is like, well, let's not kill him. Let's just throw him in a pit. And then finally, thank God that one of the brothers had a, a, a capitalist uh, business mindset. He says, well, let's not kill him because if we kill him, we can't profit anything off of him. So let's sell him as a slave. So they ended up selling uh, Joseph uh, as a slave. And one of the things you'll see, and as we keep moving forward through the life of Joseph, you'll see a theme that, that transpires in the life of Joseph where he goes basically from a, a, a situation where he is favored, where God is giving him a, a favor with men, favor in, in different areas of his life. And then he goes from favor into a situation, a, a catastrophic situation 
situation that causes him to lose everything that, that uh, he has gained. That uh, for most people, going through the situations that Joseph uh, would go through as we're, as we're going to look at his life, uh, it, would, it would stop a lot of people from advancing. It would stop a lot of people from uh, continuing to serve God. But in Joseph's life, it's like you see favor, the hand of God on his life, and then he goes through a catastrophic, negative, discouraging situation. And then from that situation, the favor of God is still present. God blesses him in that uh, situation. And then another situation. So it's just like a cycle of favor to hardship to favor to hardship. But one of the things that I wanted to uh, uh, highlight when we look at the life of Joseph, and this is something that I believe you and I could, could take in our hearts and in our lives and live by, is that as Joseph is going through life, I believe every single one of us has situations in our life where you go through a situation or a time where you feel everything is great, everything's good, God's giving me grace and favor, and then you go through a situation or something happens that causes you to, uh, your life to get shaken up or shattered, a situation, maybe a divorce, maybe somebody that, uh, that uh, stood at an altar with you and said, I'll, 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 I'll be faithful to you. I'll love you till death do us part. And maybe that person uh, turned away, cheated, left you, whatever. And you never thought that that would happen to you. But all of a sudden you're confronted with this kind of a situation. Maybe you uh, went through a, a business deal or a situation in, in business or, or you lost your job or where you lost your home or you had a situation where you had to declare bankruptcy or some kind of a negative situation happened where you're just going through life, everything's going good. And then all of a sudden this situation hits you that basically puts you to your knees. It causes you to, to cry out to God. God, where are you? I thought you loved me. How come you allowed this to happen to me? Maybe the death of a loved one. You're going through life. Things are great. And all of a sudden, somebody you love, somebody you care about, somebody that was way too young to die. Maybe they, they, they die of some kind of an illness or some kind of an accident. And you question God's plan and you question whether God loves you. And you begin, the enemy begins to use that to pull you away from God. And I've, I've sat with many ex-preachers and ex-pastors and ex-people that were in ministry and because they went through a difficult situation and they couldn't understand how a loving God would allow them to go through a situation that kind of a tragic or tragedy or, or ca catastrophe they couldn't realize it or understand it or fathom how a great loving God would allow it that they just began to push away, turn away from God they began to lose their faith and their hope and their trust in God till eventually completely living a, a, a life contrary to the will, purpose and plan of God all because of a tragedy that occurred in their life. So I want to encourage you. Joseph would go from tragedy, it seemed like tragedy to tragedy, but when you actually look at the life of Joseph, Every tragic situation that Joseph goes through, it's God is setting him in place for where he needs to be to eventually reach the place of his destiny, of his purpose. So sometimes you might go through a negative, somebody walked out on you, somebody left you, maybe a, 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 like we talked about a divorce or a bankruptcy or whatever or the death of a loved one, maybe a, a tragic situation and you have an option. You could either look at that situation as being the end of your life, as being something that will uh, stop you from accomplishing the dreams or the goals that you feel God has put on the inside of you, or you could look at every tragedy or every opposition as a situation that is moving you into place to be where God wants you to be. Maybe you move from one country to another. Maybe you have to transition into a new thing, and you're saying, God, why, why did this happen to me? I thought I was obeying you. I thought I was living for you. I'm, I'm, I'm moving forward towards the dream that you put in my heart, but just like Joseph, you might find yourself getting, uh, getting uh, thrown into a pit by his, by his brothers. Then he goes from the pit to get sold into slavery. So think from a, from a, a home full with, with prosperity and blessing, with a dream that God has given him, now he finds himself as a slave in the house of, of a man by the name of Potiphar. And we'll pick that up in verse, in chapter 39, verse number one. The Bible says, Now had, Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought him, uh, uh, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. Verse 2. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all things that he did to prosper in his hand. Verse 4. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Then he made him overseer of his house, and all that he had, 
he put under his authority. So Joseph is, is now in a position where he is sold into slavery. But even as a slave, we see the favor of God on his life. So that's, you know, no matter what situation you put, you put a man or a woman of God in, if the favor of God is on their life, and if they never turn their back on God, God has a way of prospering you and blessing you and, give, and showing His favor on your life in no matter what situation. So never blame your, a government or an organization or a system for, for the situation you're in. Always look to God, and God has the ability, like a, you know, the illustration I used to give uh, over the years is the blessing of God is like a beach ball. If you ever try and take a beach ball and push it down in the water in a swimming pool, what happens the minute you let the pressure off of that beach ball, it just shoots right back up to the top of the swimming pool. In the same way, when the favor of God is on your life, it's like that beach ball coming back to the top. You could put it, Joseph in slavery, you could throw him in a pit, you could sell him to Pontifer, and no matter what he's, no matter what situation, like that beach ball, the favor of God is on his life, he keeps bouncing back. So no, no matter what situation is going on in the world, no matter what pandemic, no matter what, maybe you lost your job, maybe you're going through a difficult time, I want to tell you, if you're a child of God and the favor of God is on your life and you continue to live for Him and you continue to serve God just like He did for Joseph, He'll do for you. Why? Because God is not a respecter of person. It's not like God loves one person more than He loves uh, somebody else. God is a rewarder of faith. He honors faith and He honors people that will seek Him with all of their heart, all of their mind, all of their soul. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and righteousness and all these other things shall be added unto you so you when you seek God with all of your heart when you live for God no matter what earthly situation you're in if the favor of God is on you he'll bring you back up to the top of that uh, to that situation so whether he was sold as a slave to Potiphar the, the Bible says that Potiphar put him in rulership over his entire household so that all that Potiphar had was under the authority of, of Joseph. And then while he's in the house of Potiphar, if you th- like, it, his life seems to be going worse to worse. From a, uh, you know, His brothers want to kill him, then finally they sell him into slavery. Now he's a slave in Potiphar's house. And then now the wife of, of Potiphar uh, begins to try and sleep or wants to sleep or have an affair with Joseph. And so you could read those verses of Scripture. I'm just going to skip for the sake of time. But they're found in verses 7 to 18 in Genesis chapter 39, where Potiphar's wife begins to say, listen, she, I mean, she just, you could read it, it's in your Bible. She just goes out just straight forward and says, let's sleep together. Come and lie with me. And Joseph explains to her, look, your, your, your husband put me in rulership, in charge over all of his household except for you because you're his wife. And I don't want to do a wicked thing to, 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 to sleep with you. So, uh, so Joseph is refusing. So then the Bible says day after day after day, the wife of Potiphar would continue to speak with Joseph, trying to get Joseph uh, to sleep with her. So this is like a, you know, this is like a, a soap opera kind of thing reading. And so she's, she's trying to get it. Finally, the Bible tells us the story that one day Joseph is, is in the house. She tries to get him to, uh, to, to have an affair with her. So Joseph d- doesn't know what to do. So he, he takes off his coat and he runs out of the house. She has the, his coat in his hands. And so finally, Potiphar's wife, not to get uh, uh, you know, caught and not to have a bad reputation, accuses Joseph of being the one that tried to, to sleep with her. And so when uh, Potiphar comes back, finds out uh, what, what his wife was saying, they end up taking Joseph and they throw him into prison. So his life goes from a pit to being sold into slavery, now being put into a prison because of a lie uh, that the wife of Potiphar uh, said about him. So now he's in prison. Go with me to verse 20, Genesis chapter 39. Then the Bible says this, Then Joseph's master took him and put him into a prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined. And when he was there in prison, but the uh, the Lord was with Joseph and showed his mercy. And he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison, verse 22. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was going, that was... um, It was his doing. Verse 23. The keeper of the prison did not look at anything that was under Joseph's authority, but the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, 
the Lord made it prosper. So you see this theme in Joseph's life. He goes from being thrown into a pit by his brothers. He goes to being uh, uh, enslaved, sold into slavery. He gets lied about by Potiphar's wife. Then he gets put into prison. But even in prison, even as an inmate, God would give him favor. And the Bible says that the, the uh, person that's in charge of that prison put everything under the authority of Joseph because he saw the favor of God in his life. So no matter what situation you might find yourself in, and I don't know who, who will watch this message. I don't know, maybe uh, at one point this will find its way to somebody. Maybe you were in jail. Maybe you're, you're in prison. And for some, somehow, some way, uh, you're, you're watching this. I want to tell you, just like Joseph was in prison, if you'll give your heart to God, God has a way of making a way where there seems to be no way he he could in in a, a, a most devastating situation God has the ability to rise and raise you back up to change your life to transform your life and no matter what you need no matter what you're you're going through he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ever ask dream or think if you're uh, if you're um if you're taking notes I don't know if you are but if you are write this this sentence down Faithfulness in every situation brings favor in every situation. Let me say it again. Faithfulness in every situation brings favor in every situation. In other words, when you're faithful to God in every situation, God will give you favor in every situation. So even if you're thrown in prison, even if you go through a negative situation, if you're a faithful individual, if you trust God, if you love Him, if you're a child of God and you've, you've built your life on His Word, I want to tell you, He is not a God that He should lie. Men are liars, but God is not a liar. He will raise you up. He'll do what nobody else could do in your life. Can I get an amen? If you believe that, type amen. And so we serve a powerful God, and we look at the life of Joseph here, and these are the one principle, and there are many things you could learn from the life of Joseph. But the one thing I want to highlight before we get into the, uh, the how Joseph's life is a prophetic illustration of the return of the Lord, I want to deal with this idea of faithfulness. And, you know, if you're faithful in prayer, if you're faithful in reading the Word, if you're faithful in connecting with, with God and advancing the kingdom of God, if you're a faithful child, a faithful servant of the Lord, God will pour out favor on your life in every situation you go through. To, you know, if, if no, the enemy wants to make you think that serving God uh, will be a bunch of hard trials, tribulations, perilous times. You know, the enemy wants to make you think like, well, you, you know, God wants to take everything from you. But in reality, serving God is the greatest life you could ever live. Because while, yes, the Bible does say that in the, you know, in the last days, perilous times will come. Yes, the Bible does say that you will have in this life, you will have trials and tribulations. But that same word also says, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. I have overcome. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So we serve a powerful God who, know, who loves us. And no matter what you're going through in life, if you'll trust him, if you'll put your faith and confidence in him, he'll take you through it. So faithfulness breeds favor. Faithfulness produces favor. And God's hand is on those that live according to the plan and purpose. So when you live according to the will and plan and purpose of God for your life, when you seek God, like Jesus said, with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul, God will direct your path. He'll guide you. He'll put, he'll put the right people at the right time in your life so that you'll be able to fulfill the plan and the purpose that he has for you. Now I want to I wanna switch gears for just a moment as we take this message to a to a close in a few minutes here, I want to look at the prophetic side of the life of Joseph. One of the things I want you to, uh, to understand, maybe if you're new to the Bible, new to Christianity, is in, in the Bible, the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, is filled with stories of men and women that lived for God, uh, that did great things. David, uh, uh, King David, who uh, you know, defeated Goliath and, and, and fought off uh, lions and bears. And you have guys like uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that were thrown into a fiery furnace. And men like Daniel who were thrown into a lion's den. Guys like Moses who stood before a Red Sea and saw it part and stood before Pharaoh and watched him say, you know, as he uh, released the people of Israel out of Egypt, men like Joshua who conquered the, the promised land. And you have all of these stories of different men uh, and women of God uh, throughout the Old Covenant 
women like Esther uh, who stood before the king on behalf of her people and, and saw God save an entire nation because of her obedience. So you have all of these people, these, these individuals that lived uh, thousands of years ago that were before Jesus came, before the cross. And in their lives, if you look carefully enough, you'll always see a prophetic illustration of what God was going to do in the future. One of the things that I love about the Word of God is that the Bible is layered. It's not just a historical document where you say, well, you know, you're reading about, you know, a, a, a family of people or individuals as they made their way through life. It's more than a historical document, and it's more than even just a spiritual document that you could receive from what God has for you in your spirit. It's also a prophetic document because actually the Bible, not only in direct prophecy you know things like the bible in the book of um, in psalms 22 where david prophesies the crucifixion of jesus or in isaiah where prophesies the coming of jesus or uh, all of the various you know over 330 some odd prophecies in regards to the life ministry of jesus so all there, there are direct prophecies but there are also situations where men and women live a life and in their life in their in the events that transpire in their life it's an actual prophetic declaration of what is coming and so you see that in the life of for example abraham when god tells abraham to sacrifice his son isaac on uh, uh, on uh, on the mountain you see that that's a type or a foreshadow prophetically that God would eventually give his son, his only begotten son uh, on Calvary. And what's an interesting fact is not only was that story prophetic in terms of what, what God was going to do, because when Abraham goes to sacrifice Isaac, God stops Abraham, tells him not to do it. And he says, I will supply the, the lamb. I will supply the sacrifice. And that's exactly what God did uh, uh, 2,000 years later, where Jesus comes down, gives his life for you and I on Calvary. Jesus was sacrificed on the same mountain, on the same hill where Abraham climbed up to sacrifice Isaac. So, you know, when, I, when we traveled to Israel uh, um, two years ago and we're standing there and our guide was explaining that this is where uh, Abraham climbed up to sacrifice Isaac. And then not too far off, about five minutes, uh, a walking distance from there were the place where they believed Jesus was, uh, was nailed on the cross cross was crucified so not only was God speaking prophetically in that story all throughout the Old Testament you have men and women that are living a life that not only is it historical and not only can we glean practical application but we could also see from a prophetic standpoint what their life represents and what G, what, uh, what's going to happen in the future based on their life. So for example, uh, another illustration would be Moses. There's a time where God is going to destroy all of the nation of Israel and Moses stands in between God and the people of Israel. And uh, the Bible says that God changed his mind because of Moses. So somebody had asked me that question years ago. If God is all powerful, if he's all knowing, why could a man change God's mind? But when you understand that a lot of these stories are God allows them to be there as a prophetic utterance to what God would do in the future, you realize that Moses, just like Abraham, was a type or a foreshadow of Jesus dying on the cross. Moses would be a type or a foreshadow of God's judgment wanting to come down on, on humanity. But Jesus would be the intermediator between God and humanity and God Jesus would take on our punishment and God's anger and God's wrath against sin would be put on Jesus and not on us. So Moses was a type or a foreshadow of what Jesus would do would stand before us and God. And so throughout the Old Testament you have men after men, uh, story after story of, of types or foreshadow of what God would do in the future and none greater than the life of Joseph. The life of Joseph has so many prophetic similarities to the life of Jesus, probably more so than almost any other uh, Old Testament figure. And I want to just read a few of them to you just so that you could see how the life of Joseph and the life of Jesus, how Joseph's entire life was a prophetic foreshadow of what Jesus would come to do. So number one, Joseph had 12 brothers. Jesus had 12 disciples. Joseph was sold for the price of a common slave. Jesus was sold for the price of a common slave. Ju uh, uh, the, the 
brother that, deci- that decided to sell Joseph was Judah. And the disciple that decided to sell Jesus was Judas. So you have all of these similarities. Jesus started his earthly ministry at the age of 30 years old. And Joseph stood before Pharaoh, uh, uh, standing in or at the beginning of his destiny or the, the reason, the, the dream that God had given him at he, when he was 30 years old. Both, Jude, uh, both Joseph and Jesus received false accusations. Uh, Joseph received a false accusation by Potiphar's wife, which caused him to be thrown into prison. Jesus was brought before the religious leaders and eventually uh, to Pontius Pilate. And based on false accusations, he was sent to the cross. Because Joseph was sent to prison, he went from prison to eventually being moved to the right hand of Pharaoh. So Joseph went from a position of, of, um, of a slave to a prisoner to eventually going to the right hand of Pharaoh. And how that happened was because when, the, when Joseph was in prison, he revealed the dreams of two men that were in prison with him. One was a, uh, was a cupbearer and the other was the butler. And they both had two dreams and Joseph revealed the dreams. One was going to die and one was going to be put back into his position. And the Bible says that Joseph spent a full two years in prison. And at the beginning of the third year, uh, the uh, Pharaoh had a dream and the, uh, the cupbearer who had been restored to his position remembered Joseph and told Pharaoh, there's a man in prison that was able to reveal my dream. I'm sure he'll be able to reveal this dream. So Pharaoh calls on Joseph and Joseph goes from the prison up to the right hand of, of Pharaoh. And actually, I'll, I'll read you that, that scripture because it's powerful. In Genesis chapter 41 verse 39 the bible says this then pharaoh said to joseph inasmuch as god has shown you all this the dream and there is no one as discerning and as wise as you you shall be over all of my house and all my people shall be ruled according to your word only in regards to the throne will i be greater than you and pharaoh said to joseph see i have set you over all things in egypt so so joseph goes from from being in a a prison cell to getting in one day getting brought up to being at the right hand of pharaoh and putting in and being put in charge of all of the wealth of of uh, of of Egypt and in the same way Jesus gets crucified because of false accusations and on the very beginning of the third day just like Joseph was in prison for for two days and at the beginning of uh, two years and at the beginning of the third year he gets released and goes to uh, to be in charge of, of Egypt Jesus was in the grave for two days and at the beginning of the third day he is raised up again and the Bible says he goes he ascends to the right hand of the father and he is seated in heavenly places with dominion with power with authority that there's no name under heaven and earth by which men shall be saved. So you have these parallels between the life of Joseph. Uh, it, detail from the, you know, being sold as a slave and uh, the price of a common slave. Jesus was sold for the same price as a common slave. So all of these similarities. So you see the prophetic uh, illustration in the life of Joseph of what Jesus would eventually do for you and I. But there's one last part of this, uh, this the story of um, of Joseph that I believe is uh, brings us a, a revelation of the second coming because all of the aspects of the life of Joseph we we see them being fulfilled uh, in Jesus Jesus fulfills it so prophetically except this last part there's a, when you read the story of Joseph there's the 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 the, fin, the final uh, uh, chapter final verses there it tells you that uh, all of his brothers, Joseph, his brothers were in Egypt and they were dying of starvation. There was a famine, uh, that, that, which is what Joseph had revealed the dream of Pharaoh, that a famine was coming. And so the, uh, Jacob sends all of his, uh, his kids to, to see if they could, or some of his kids, to see if they could get some help from Egypt. When they go to Egypt, they, they, they come into you know, Joseph's uh, court because now Joseph was in rulership, but they don't recognize Joseph. They don't recognize it's his brother. Yeah, he, he's dressed and looks like an Egyptian. He's not even speaking uh, their language. And so the, the Bible tells us that they'll come in and they'll, they'll meet with Joseph, but they don't know him. They don't see him. They don't realize who he is. Then they'll go back to their father. Then they'll come back a second time. 
uh, to, to Egypt. Again, they'll meet Joseph. Again, they don't, real, they don't realize who he is. They don't know it's, it's, it's their brother. Then they'll go back home, and then they're going to come back a third time. And when they come back the third time, then it's at that time that Joseph removes uh, the, 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 the mask and he begins to uh, share, he begins to remove all of his Egyptian garment and he begins to share with them in tears that he is their brother, that they tried to kill, that they tried to murder and now he's the one that, uh, that was actually the one saving them. So what a picture of how Jesus, who is the one, the savior of humanity, the same one that they killed, the, and, and this is speaking to the Jewish people that, that were there, the religious religious leaders that wanted to uh, have Jesus murdered, the same one that they wanted killed, now is the one coming back to save them. And so the same brother that they wanted to sell as a slave and kill, that same brother is now the one uh, redeeming them and saving them. That's a, a, a picture of Jesus. But it's on the third time that they go into Egypt that, that Joseph reveals himself to them. And so I was reading a, you know, a preacher that I love, John Hagee, uh, many years ago, ha- preached on this subject. And one of the things that he was mentioning in his message was in the same way that the, the nation of Israel, uh, the, the, the brothers of, of um, Joseph, who represent the nation of Israel, had to go three times into Egypt. And then it was on the third time that Joseph revealed himself. Prophetically speaking, if every other aspect of the life of Joseph lines up with what Jesus did, the Bible says in the book of of Revelations, in, in the last few chapters of the book of Revelations, that one day Jesus is coming back. And when he comes back, he'll come back not only to, to redeem humanity, he'll come back to establish his kingdom. But the Bible says that everybody will recognize Jesus as being the King of kings and the Lord of lords. In other words, a lot of people that even uh, the part of the, the Jewish, uh, um, uh, part of the nation of Israel, who don't view Jesus as being Messiah or being the King of kings or being the Lord of lords, the Bible prophesies that there will... At the end of that tribulation period, Jesus will reveal himself to humanity. He will reveal himself to uh, his own people, to the nation of Israel, and they will see for the first time that he is the King of Kings, that he is the Messiah, that he is the Lord. In the same way that Joseph revealed himself to his, his brothers on the third time that they went in, and historically that relates to Israel. There are three times in history that the nation of Israel has gone into uh, and, and had the uh, the the territory of Jerusalem or the city of Jerusalem. The first time was under the leadership of Joshua. And then they were exiled uh, by the Babylonians. And then they came back a second time into the nation of Israel under the, uh, uh, during the time of Nehemiah. And then they were exiled again. And then they came in finally uh, 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 to, to possess the, the land uh, a third time in 1948. So, so the first time under Joshua, get exiled. Second time under Nehemiah. And then that lasted for, for many, many years all the way through the life of Jesus. Finally, they get exiled uh, through the Romans. Uh, in about 60 AD and then for the, the, the final time in 1948 the third time where the nation of Israel is established by the United Nations and now is declared a nation again so in the same way had the, the brothers of Joseph came in three times and on the third time Jesus uh, Joseph revealed himself I believe that in a similar manner now that it's the third time or the third era that the nation of Israel has been reestablished we are on the brick uh, uh, we are on uh, the, the, the brink of the second coming of our Lord and Savior. And the same way that Joseph revealed who he was to his brothers, Jesus is coming back. He's not coming back in a manger. He's not coming back as a baby. He's not coming back as a toddler. He's not coming back to be murdered and killed on a cross in a rugged and cruel way. He is coming back with, on, the Bible says, uh, with a white robe. He is coming back on a white horse. He is coming back with flames in his, in his mouth. He is coming back. Uh, uh, with a vesture written kings of kings and lord of lords he is coming back and he is going to reveal himself to humanity and so i want to encourage you just like every other aspect of the life of joseph was prophetic about the life of jesus this last and final aspect of how he reveals himself to his family is also prophetic that we are getting closer and closer to the coming of our lord and savior and so i want to encourage you not to put fear in your heart but i want to encourage you 
you to live for God like never before. To make a choice in your, to say, to put your foot down and say, I am a child of God. I don't live in fear. I don't live in anxiety. I don't live with depression, but I stand firmly on the word of God knowing that he that's in me is greater than he that's in the world. And I want you to put your heart and your trust and your faith in that Lord, in that King, that Jesus that saved me, that Jesus that redeemed me could do the same for you where you are right now if you'll put your heart, your trust, and your faith in him. He's no respecter of person. He loved me. He saved me when I should have been dead at the age of 17. When I should be, I, I should not be alive to speak this word. The Holy Spirit, Jesus woke my parents up at almost midnight, 11, close to midnight on a, on a, a, um, a, a warm day in the month of July, back when I was 17 years old told my parents where I was. I was, on the, I was unconscious and had my parents not come and not showed up at that house at that time and I had not been taken to the hospital, I would be dead today. But because there is a living Savior, because there is a God in heaven that's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ever ask or think, I'm alive and well and able to preach this gospel to you. And I want to encourage you not to make a decision to live a, a religious, uh, you know, there's, there's some people they're, they're so religious. They're so more focused on correcting everybody and everybody's got to have perfect doctrine and theology. And if you don't think like me, I want you to push those people aside. Like that woman with the issue of blood, just push all the religious people aside and make your way to Jesus because in him there's life. In him there's abundance. In him there's peace. In him there's joy. And if you'll put your trust in him, he'll never leave you nor forsake you. So whether or not we're in that final generation or whether the Lord will come back in a thousand years from now, I don't know and I don't claim to know. But one thing that I do know is that he is coming back and, and, and in the meantime, he's given us the responsibility, number one, to live for him and number two, to advance the kingdom of God until he comes. So I want to pray with you before we close. If you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, if you're, if you're, uh, if you're hearing maybe this message for the first time, you never heard that about Joseph and Jesus and how prophetically uh, uh, God prophesied things thousands of years before it transpired. If you're if the Holy Spirit is touching your heart and you need to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, I want to ask you to pray with me. It's a short and simple prayer. It's not a prayer that's, a, it's not a magic prayer, but it will simply begin the process in your life of you giving your heart to Jesus. The Bible says in the book of Romans that if you believe in your heart, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you shall be saved. So if you want to just close your, uh, close your eyes, bow your head right there where you are in your home. And just repeat this prayer with me. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your Son to die for me. I ask you that, that you would forgive me of all my sins. I ask that you would come and be the Lord of my life. I ask you to change me and transform me. I love you. I honor you. And I praise you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, I want to welcome you to the kingdom of God. I want to welcome you to the family of God. Uh, I want to tell you that there's no greater decision that you could ever make in your entire life than to put your heart, faith, and trust in Jesus. He'll, he'll care for you. He'll direct you. He'll guide you. He'll fill your life with purpose and peace. And no matter what situation you go through, just like Joseph who might have went through one catastrophe after another, God has a way of bringing you to the top with his favor on your life and he'll do the same for you as he did for Joseph. And if you're watching and you're a believer and you're a child of God and you've been born again for many years, I want to pray with you as well that the fire of God would stay stirring in your spirit, that you would not get tired or, you know, the Bible says don't get weary in well-doing. Don't get tired for, uh, in living for God, but actually to renew your strength and renew your spirit and renew that flame of uh, uh, the passion for God that was in your heart from the very beginning. So I want to pray with you. Heavenly Father, I honor you today. I love you. I praise you. I magnify your name. Lord, I pray for every person watching online. Lord, no matter what they're going through today, maybe, what, maybe they've gone through situations that nobody else really knows how it's affected their hearts except for you, Lord. Maybe they've gone through a divorce. Maybe they've gone through a bankruptcy. Maybe people that they thought that would be in their lives forever ended up dying suddenly or at a young age or whatever the situation might be. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would move in their hearts and in their lives today, that you would fill their homes with your power and your presence, that you would redeem the time, that you would restore in their life everything and anything that the enemy might have stole from them. Heavenly Father, we honor you. We pray 
praise you and we magnify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I love you. It's always a great blessing to be able to come into your home and preach the Word of God. And hopefully we'll be able to see each other soon. But in the meantime, keep moving forward. Keep praying. Keep seeking the Lord with all of your heart, mind, and soul. If you need anything, let us know. Uh, we'd be happy to pray with you. I'd be happy to pray with you. You could call us here at the church. Send us an email. Anyway, I love you. God bless you. We'll see you this Wednesday night uh, for the um, go-to meeting and then next Sunday morning at 1115. God bless.